Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hello, my name is Oshibi Craig. I am the inaugural director of the Center for Arts, Migration, and Entrepreneurship, better known as CAME, here at the College of the Arts on the campus of the University of Florida. As we gather today uh, in this hybrid virtual space, uh, cultivated by our collaborating partners here at the Digital Worlds Institute, uh, I welcome you. Um, Came and Digital Worlds are both located here in Gainesville, Florida, on the indigenous lands of the Timakua, Patano, Seminole, and Creek First Nations people. We pause for a moment to acknowledge those people and our ancestors who paved the way for us to be here today. Our center seeks to connect networks of scholars, artists, creatives, entrepreneurs, advocates to the engines of creative and cultural economics at the heart of migration. Importantly, our goal is to not simply study, but to actively partner with diasporic and migratory communities in Florida and beyond to drive new methods and models to restore power, generate value back to the cultural makers, these actual entrepreneurs, that make this community and this country great. Our center boasts over 50 CAME affiliate faculty members from across the world, in South Africa, Australia, here in the US, from California to Texas, to Virginia and back here to Florida. Across our campus, we have representatives from the College of Engineering, the School of Business, the College of Law, the University Libraries, Center for African Studies, Center for European Studies, Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, Departments of Anthropology, Geography, and Political Science, Warrington uh, School of Business, and of course here in the College of the Arts. We are truly an amazing group of affiliate faculty members. And I must say today, you're in for a treat as you hear from three incredible faculty members that have joined us here physically on campus. Before I go any further, I must get a couple things out the way. Uh, first, uh, I wanna say thank you to our co-sponsors, the Center for African Studies, uh, with a special shout out to Dr. Aliun Sao, Todd Leedy, Sarah Fox, and Brenda Chalfin for the invaluable partnership and support, and most of all, collaborating spirit. I am so happy to invite you to today, today's event. Women, Entrepreneurship, AI, and Emerging Tech in Africa. This is going to be a truly incredible uh, morning, and followed up with an afternoon chat that we're going to have at UF Innovate. Uh, and this conversation is really about things that are going on, uh, and these specific women talking about their roles leading technological and innovative partnerships and entrepreneurship in, for, and with the continent of Africa. Today, we are bringing Kashar Rogers, Saida Nash Carter, and Dr. S. Ama Ray to this virtual panel. So uh, a few housekeeping things. You are here, uh, and we hope to hear your voice and conversation as we move throughout this process. I am asking specifically that you join us in the chat. So send your messages in, react to what the presenters are presenting, and definitely bring questions in, because at the end of the panel, uh, we're going to sit down together and have a discussion and pull from some of the questions that you put in. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone to Ms. Kashar Rogers. Thank you. Thanks, Osu, for the for the great introduction and thank everyone for joining us today. Um, should be exciting. I'm grateful for the opportunity to actually discuss some of the work that I've been doing over the last 25 years. And just as a you know an introduction, most of what I'm gonna be sharing with you is based on a set of experiences, but also a series of mistakes. So I'm gonna share a whole lot of lessons that I've learned over the years in developing uh, technology solutions that actually solve very complex problems. So the title of this presentation is on iterative innovation. Uh, and this is basically how we've used creativity or what I'm going to call creative intelligence, uh, entrepreneurship, but also technology to solve some complex problems. So a bit about my bio. I'm sure someone will post it in the chat. The best way to learn about my work is at my website. Uh, it's at kishaw.com. Uh, I'm probably the only kishaw on the internet. 
first name, Kishon. <laughs> so you can find me pretty much everywhere on Twitter or wherever your preferred social network is. I'm at Kishon. Uh, I've already mentioned I have about 25 years of experience uh, developing technology solutions. And my background is in computer science. Uh, I'm a four time entrepreneur. I'm currently the CEO at Time Study. And before we get started, I'll tell you a bit about Time Study and what we do in a few seconds. Uh, worked on quite a few projects through both Time Study, but also um, I have an agency called Big Thinking and Web Smith Studio uh, that I own. And a lot of the ideas for my businesses actually start there. And so I'll talk a bit about the process for innovation, starting with the, the birth of the ideas. Uh, he mentioned uh, affiliation with uh, the University of Florida here through CAME. Um, I've also been advisor to ventures like Level Up Ventures, which is a fund for underrepresented uh, tech founders uh, that is based in New York. I'm one of their advisors. I'm also advisors to places like Virginia Commonwealth University's Department of Computer Science. I'm the president of the Industry Advisory Board and a host of other startups and programs. I live in Virginia. Um, and as it states here, I live in Virginia with my two kids and my dog named Chip. All right. So I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of practice. Uh, taking ideas from conception to market. So the structure of this talk is going to be around the process. And so from the beginning of generating an idea into the space where you actually grow and scale ideas. So I wanted to begin with a few statistics. Uh, this is just to give everyone a sense of what it's like uh, to actually start any venture, uh, any sort of startup, and whether it's a creative idea or a technology startup. This is pretty much the landscape. Uh, it can be navigated, but I wanted to begin with these numbers. So only about 4% of businesses generate more than $1 million in revenue. Um, so that's a really low number. That may be surprising. There are tons of businesses, but it takes a lot of effort to get past $1 million of recurring revenue per year. Uh, as you may already know, 92% of startups fail within the first three years. Uh, about 2% of venture funding went to all female founding teams which is a critically low number. Uh, less than 3% of funding is, is going to black founders. 72% uh, of venture capital is actually concentrated in the top 10 cities in the world. And 40% of businesses are profitable. So what you see here is a pretty, uh, pretty complicated landscape to actually be successful in startups. And so what I'm gonna talk about is how we, at least at Time Study and some other ventures that I've worked on, how we became successful and how we navigated these numbers uh, through iterative innovation. So I wanted to begin with the numbers because I think it's really important to lead with numbers. So I'm gonna focus a lot on some of the things we've done at Time Study and how that idea came about. Uh, currently Time Study uh, is actually in use in over a hundred hospitals. Uh, we have processed tens of millions of time related transactions, uh, hundreds and thousands of activities and categories. Uh, tens of thousands of people that serve patients in hospitals. Uh, eight out of 10 of our clients are ranked the number one in their region. Uh, none of our customers have churned since we launched this business. We have never lost a single customer. And we currently have three times recurring revenue year over year. 62% of our accounts are growing. So I wanted to start with those numbers because I think it's really important for what I'm about to say. I'm gonna tell you how we were able to accomplish this. So I wanted to start with process. This is basically a cheat sheet. So if you don't wanna to listen to the rest of this, this is basically how we execute ideas. Uh, we plan, the planning process really is the generation of ideas, the funding of your effort, everything that goes into creating your roadmap, that's your planning stage. Building, a lot of people like to start with building. They get an idea and they just wanna launch the idea immediately and start to execute. But then you build and execute on what you've learned during the planning stage measure your success, and then you learn from that. A fifth bucket could be exit. Um, many people begin their ventures with an exit in mind. All right, so I'm gonna start with the generation of ideas. Uh, I mentioned that this talk will be structured a bit around the company time study. So I'll mention that, but I'll also mention a few other projects. Um, so the first thing is being in an environment that allows you to generate great ideas. So in order to do that, you actually have to be open to ideas. And a part of being open, really, it starts with, number one, being curious. And it's one of the 
most underrated skills that I actually hire for when I hire people, certainly I'm hiring them for a very specific skill set for the role, but I'm also looking for people that are really curious about the way the world works and why things are the way they are. Curiosity, that space is a great space to generate great ideas. Um, I wanted to mention two things about ideation because one of the big myths with ideation is that you have to be the first person in market doing something very unique. And actually it's a myth. Companies like Google and Facebook were not first. They were not Google. When Google entered the search engine market, I think there were about 20 search engines already operational and running. Facebook was, we all know that Facebook wasn't the first social network. So that's a myth that you actually have to be the first at something. Also, ideas evolve. So another point that I wanted to make is generally your first idea is not the idea that you end up executing. So a company such as Groupon, for example, Groupon was a blog. It was actually a WordPress blog. They began a blog and they would actually create posts and just type in discount codes. And that blog was really designed so that they can understand whether or not people wanted to receive that type of value. Um, Airbnb started as a website for renting out air beds in people's homes and look at where Airbnb is now. Now the entire site is rent renting vacation rentals. Um, I wanted to talk about time study as an idea. We actually discovered our idea very organically. So I launched time study in 2018, but time study was actually an idea that I began working on about eight years before that. Um, I was already building a lot of software for hospitals and in doing work with the types of customers that we serve, we actually discovered the idea for time study. So we actually created a series of products for not the same client, but for different clients. And we were able to see a pattern of need across those clients. And by 2018, we realized that a lot had changed in the market in terms of data. And so it was time for us to actually launch time study. So time study was an idea that we already knew about that we didn't lean into until 2018 for a lot of different reasons. We spent a lot of time with our customers understanding what their needs were, running some prototyping experiments, but it really came about very, very organically. The second thing I wanna talk about is customer discovery. So you have, an, you have an idea like time study, for example, and then you may have some idea of who can use this product or service. The first, the next step is not to build. Again, I think everyone wants to start building and writing code and creating things. The next step is actually to learn more about the people that you wanna serve. So I'll talk about how, so time study is one thing. I'll also talk about another project that I worked on. Uh, one of the best ways to validate your audience is to try not to sell them your idea, which goes a bit counterintuitive to people that are really excited about this new thing that you're about to create. But the best way to learn people is to talk about their pain points and to learn more about what's keeping them up at night without selling them a pre-baked idea. Uh, we did that with time study. We really let the customers drive a lot in the early years. And so what that meant for us was sometimes the customer's idea of the solution was a little bit different than what we thought it should be at that phase. And what we learned was that there was a lot of variability in our customers that we didn't know about. And so that's why selling your idea too early on actually um, can rob you of a few lessons that you need to learn about your customers. The first thing you wanna do is to look for patterns. So as you're talking with people about, your, uh, about their day and their role and how they interact in the world day to day, you actually wanna look at patterns across audiences. People like this have this experience. This is the, the, the pain that's keeping them up at night. Um, a few years ago, I worked on a project called Peerloak. It was another business. This was my third company, I believe. Uh, it's called Peerloak. I co-founded that company with the professor of computer science uh, in Virginia. Uh, his name was Dr. Chang. And we actually spent, I think it was about six months talking to 100 strangers. So it was through a National Science Foundation grant. And as a part of that grant, uh, the grant was our funding for our MVP phase. We actually had to go out and meet 100 strangers and actually learn a little bit more about the idea and the product that we thought we were building. Uh, at the end of that project, 
we learned a lot and we also learned that we were way off track with what we thought we were building and what our audience needed. Um, talking to strangers is hard. <laughs> I think it's easier to, to sell ideas to people that you know, um, because people that you know wanna support you. So they're gonna start from a very warm place. When you speak to customers about what their pain points are, what you may learn is that the thing that you thought was valuable to them is actually not what they value. And that's why you can't talk about your idea too early on. So next, so next, let's say we have, you know, a pretty good idea of our customers, who they are, what their pain points are. And this is the point where you start actually building your roadmap. So early on in time study, we were able to talk a lot to customers around their pain points because we were already serving them in a different capacity. Um, creating a roadmap, though, is a different thing. And this is where you start to iterate on your idea. So one of the things that I think, like every company has a sort of secret sauce or a thing that they do really well. And I will say one of the things that we do really, really well at Time Study is identifying leverage points. And what I mean by that is we have a big goal, like we have this big moonshot dream for the company, but our roadmap really identifies a series of small steps that actually get us to that goal. And that's really the trick to early successful innovation in a startup is to number one, know your audience's pain point, be able to align that pain point with your moonshot, but also to see what is the next small step that I can take that makes a big difference for these customers. And so for time study, what we realized was the way people were tracking time and healthcare environments was actually causing more overhead. So one of the problems that we were solving was basically to free people up to do the work that they love, they're most passionate about, and that represents their highest skill. Uh, one of the barriers to being able to do that, and what I mean by that specifically is like in a, in a sector like healthcare, doctors spend about 30% of their time with patients. The rest of that time is spent on other things. And no matter what you do, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, you can probably relate to that, where you spend a portion of your day just doing a lot of stuff and there's a small portion where you feel like you're really in flow with your work. So we learned that really early on in time study and our moonshot is to create a platform that allows the companies to free people up to do their best work by keeping them what we call top of license. And so one of the things we learned was that the biggest barrier to getting there was that companies didn't have great data. They had no idea like to, how to quantify overhead time in a way that was accurate. So our first step wasn't a big moonshot to solve this problem. Our first step was actually to create a data platform that allowed our clients to see where overhead existed. And in that project, we actually, the first round of our project, we were able to earn our hospitals about $200,000 per physician in revenue just by highlighting overhead time. So that was a very small piece of a really big idea that we have. So <laughs> that's what I mean by leverage points. And so it really just required a different way of thinking about how you collect data, where you collect data. And it's a, it's a small piece of a big pie. And so I see that as one of the, the secrets of success for startups is having the ability to have a moonshot idea, but to also be able to iterate on that idea. I have a point here about game theory that I wanted to mention. I'm sorry, as well. So game theory is if you know the rules, you can do the math. Um, that's another thing. Understanding how things work is really important. And so that was another thing that we learned as well was the reason why there was so much overhead wasn't really a data problem. It was a policy problem, a procedure problem, a regulation problem, a leadership problem. There were a lot of different things that actually led to that being the case. And so a part of our process of identifying leverage points is really understanding how systems work. Why curiosity again? Why is this happening? Why? And just keep peeling back those layers and then that you reach a leverage point at that point. Okay, next. Um, next, I wanna talk about business matters. So. A lot of people are in the creative space and when you're in a creative flow, sometimes you miss the, um, you, you don't focus as much on business and business is important. And the way that I see business as being important for creative industries is that if you don't have runway or gas, you could burn out 
pretty easily, especially if you're trying to solve a big problem. So one of the things you want to figure out is how to create a valuable experience for your audience, but also for your business. And value could mean a lot of things for the business. It could be revenue to continue to run, but it could also be that your team continues to enjoy the work. So I don't, didn't want to miss that. Um, I have a a document here that's around business matters that I wanted to point out because I think it's important, particularly for startups, uh, is understanding the kind of work that you're doing, because not all work is different. So at Time Study, our work is, is a system, it's a SaaS platform, it's one platform for everyone. But some creative work, it's not, it's one-on-one, -on -one. I'm going to make you a dress. No other dress exists like this in the world. So knowing where you fit on that spectrum is hugely important because that helps you to define not just the price, but the experience that your customer should be having, which is a key piece of actually building assets, but also creating more, um, creating less variability in, in what you're doing. Next. I don't want to miss the sandbox. Um, I want to make a quick point about sandboxes. So I mentioned variability. Variability is one thing that in a business, if it's if you don't plan for it or you're not aware of, aware of it, variability can kill your business. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't exist. One of the things we've done in time studies, we've actually created what I'm calling a sandbox for new ideas. And so that when something new comes up that you didn't plan to work on, we actually have a designated space place and time that we fund for people to explore new ideas. And that's where we test out some of these untested theories. So creating sandboxes is important. Sandboxes don't have to be virtual or they don't have to look any specific way, but I've found that a physical space for that works for us. So my team actually meets twice a year to actually come together in a space that is very creative and inspiring to think of new ideas and new things to test out. Next. So next is execution. This is the part that most people consider to be the sexiest part of running a startup. Most people start here. <laughs> a lot of people actually start here. They just start building something. So one of the things that we do, and even as a, a company that is a technology company, and my background is computer science, a lot of my team members are engineers, uh, there is a tendency to want to solve every problem with code. And so one of the things that we do very differently from other technology companies is when we have a problem, I, we're are actually prohibited from coming up with a coding solution. So we always solve it on paper. So we have to basically as a team say, how would you solve this problem if you could not write a single line of code? And I found that that's the most powerful thing you can do for people that work in technology. Because like similar to a carpenter, if you give them a hammer and say, hey, build me a chair, they're going to use the hammer to build the chair. If you give a computer programmer a problem, they're going to write code to solve the problem. And one of the things I've learned is not all problems require tech. And so some of the best tech in the world recognize that it allows you to actually focus your resources on the part that really matters. And so a bit about tech as a tool. I mentioned the um, no code solution. Also, there's what I'm going to call the blank slate method that we use as well. Blank slating is when you are faced with a problem, pretend like your solution doesn't exist. Just start from scratch. And again, that whole exercise is, is really just an exercise in your understanding of the landscape that you're working in. If you really understand the customers and what they're presenting to you, then you'll have a much, much deeper understanding of the problem if you don't assume that your technology solves that problem. Um, I have a, other, a few other other points here about the iceberg method. That's a systems thinking tool. Um, it's another way of thinking about the environment that you're working in. So the iceberg, really the concept of that is that 90% of the iceberg is below the surface. And so when you're presented with anything like a data problem, a tech problem, any type of problem, there's a bunch of things under the surface, policies, procedures, uh, bottlenecks, rules, regulations, behaviors, all types of dysfunctions that are under the surface that actually impact your ability to solve the problem. So using that as a way to understand the landscape is important as well. Okay. I do want to mention AI uh, because I think it's something we should be talking about today. I believe it's in the title of this event, so I should probably mention it. Uh, my philosophy on AI is that um, I, I think of it just like any other tool. AI is a tool for me. Um, AI actually accelerates things that work really well. So I think the trick is having things work well. 
and then determining when AI is appropriate for that. And so we actually follow that at Time Study as well. Um, when we launched the company, we knew that this was going to be an AI company. But on day one, we did not use artificial intelligence because we were not ready. We didn't understand enough about our customers. We didn't have enough data. We didn't understand enough about what triggered changes in data. So our first step was really to honestly use the AI or use the roadmap, I should say, to lead us to that that environment where we can use AI. And then a few quick points on metrics. So that's one of our, after you build, you should be measuring something. You should actually know what you're trying to measure before you build, actually. So maybe this is a bit out of sequence, <laughs> but measuring what matters. And what I could point out here is there's a, there's a theory called the 16 basic desires theory that I think is really important. It's where you align what you're doing on one of these 16 basic desires that guide all human behavior. That's appropriate for any industry, including tech and especially tech. And then the metrics, Success can mean a lot of things for different people. So for certain companies, success is financial. For other, comp for other companies, it's an impact statement. How many people do you impact? So just knowing what means, what, what is success to you, but also what is success to your audience? Because you could be misaligned around success, which is a completely different, different issue. So this is a few tips on defining success metrics and around what matters most to you and your audience. And then finally, <laughs> the go or no go is what I want to call this. So I mentioned earlier, we have an idea, uh, we create a roadmap, we take the first step on the roadmap, we don't take all of the steps, just the first step, we've defined what we're measuring for success, we build something that our customers can touch and use, we measure whether or not that works, and then we reach this stage. And this is where we debrief. What was what did we learn? What was successful? Where did we fail? Should we be considering an alternative approach? And what is the next best step? And that's actually how we built time study. We started with a very specific idea that was really broad. And then we just learned a little bit more about our customers. We leaned, leaned in on one concept. We built something for them to touch and use. We measured their success. And we've continued to do that over the last four years. And then final point, I know I said the last one was the final, but I wanted to mention uh, a bit about the future of work because that's the space that I work in and thinking about artificial intelligence. I believe that the competitive advantage that everyone has is not their ability to use technology, it's their ability to collaborate with other people to generate ideas. That's the future of work. Thank you. Kashara, thank you so much for that. Um, lots and lots of content, lots and lots of information. Uh, note that this is the first part of a two-part uh, event that we have today. So for everyone that is in Gainesville, we definitely welcome you to come and hang out with us um, this afternoon at four o'clock at UF Innovate. All right, so uh, lots of information, lots of content. Let's take a moment to take a deep breath and relax our shoulders. If you haven't gotten some water, make sure you get some water. We're gonna make sure that Kashar gets some water. <laughs> and uh, definitely get make sure everybody is hydrated. I'm gonna bring our next panelist up. Uh, and so as she comes up, uh, we're bringing up Saida Nash Carter to present. I ask everybody to take, stand up, stretch your body out, make sure that you're not getting stiff, get some new oxygen and new energy moving through your space uh, as we are in, in this event with you, um, as I'm in the background pacing and listening as well. Uh, but we want to make sure that everybody is comfortable and that uh, in this two hour period that you're with us, everybody is still moving and taking care of themselves. So uh, our next presenter, Ms. Saida Nash Carter. Hello. <laughs> My name is Saida Nash Carter and uh, I am going to be speaking about advancing equity and crowdsourcing our stories and decolonizing AI. Um, the two projects that I'm going to be talking about specifically as it relates to crowdsourcing and decolonizing artificial intelligence are the Global Colonizer Reparation Index and Ask an Elder. Those two projects are related as you will learn shortly. So this journey for me all began with a desert themed uh, family vacation in Namibia where um, we spent 
about a week in the Namib desert. So my family and I live in uh, Cape Town, South Africa and to the Northwest of South Africa um, is Namibia and it's largely desert. And um, sadly we learned after that vacation, after returning from having had a great time actually, that um, a very sad history of that region is that um, well, some people say the first um, German inflicted genocide actually occurred in Namibia. And um, they actually pushed 20,000 um, indigenous people, the Namaqua and Herero peoples into the desert to die of dehydration and starvation um, when they landed on the coast of Namibia. Okay, so we have spent, um, lots of time in that desert. We had no idea that this had happened. Um, and we're a family that does a fair amount of research before we travel. Um, and that sort of landed um, with me in a way that was transformative and really sort of lifted up this need, I felt, to make sure that these stories are not forgotten, that these stories are known, um, and that the next family that um, takes a drive through the desert and um, cares about this kind of thing, has an opportunity to um, sit, respect, reflect, um, and maybe even connect with ancestors in that space. Um, and so that sort of leads me to um, the Global Colonizer Reparation Index, which is um, the overarching project that I'm working on right now. And I wanna start with definitions because those are a lot of words and they're big words and they're heavy words. So I think breaking them down to understand how we think about these things uh, is important. So first it's global because our perspective is global. Um, the impact of colonization is uh, global and structural racism is global. Um, colonization, we use that word because we uh, it's more of an umbrella really. And we believe that slavery, colonization and ultimately capitalism is a continuum and that's been sort of progressing over uh, a 500 year period or so. Uh, we use the term reparation uh, with a focus on healing and repair. And we talk about repair both um, or in multiple ways, social, environmental, and financial. And what we center really is shared prosperity and better futures for all people. Uh, and we use the term index because as Kashal mentioned earlier, measurement matters, right? And um, you can't manage what you don't measure. And we also know because we are all a part of this capitalist system, also as Kashal mentioned, um, that numbers drive accountability and they also drive progress and performance. So what is a moonshot? when you, you know, global colonizer reparation index, right? This, this is a big problem. It's a big challenge. It's uh, fraught with complexity. Um, and a, a good friend and um, very inspirational leader, Fred Swanaker, who runs the African Leadership Group describes um, or defines a moonshot as something that is so ambitious that sounds impossible when you say it first, right? Um, it's radical, it's um, unconventional, and has the potential to really disrupt and or completely transform status quo. Um, and then they also provide several unexpected benefits uh, in the same way that, you know, landing a man on the moon led to a number of additional innovations. So that idea of um, a moonshot really comes from, uh, JFK in the early 60s when we were committing to landing a man on the moon and everyone kind of thought, oh my God, can we do this? But it is a moonshot, right? It is it is hard, but we do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. And we do it because it's important. And that's why we're doing this work. So our moonshot mission um, has two prongs. The first one is around healing and human connection. Um, believe this work, the intention of this work is to deepen human connection through the collection and sharing of stories and lived experiences. It's about benefiting from the wisdom and the lived experiences of Black and Indigenous people of color, um, our elders today, and then by extension, our ancestors through them. 
we believe this as um, to be important really to engage in a collective uh, community imagining of what's possible um, as we think about the future and how that future can be more equitable. The second prong is truth and accountability. And there we're talking about really using the power of data science and data visualization to offer a more inclusive and accessible representation of world history. Um, and to provide actionable information to governments, corporates, and other institutions. Um, and to really in develop more inclusive data sets that support the creation of more equitable AI tools and services. So we have some guiding principles that um, we sort of center around and speak to kind of how we do the work, um, who we are as um, the people behind the project. Um, and what's centered there is very much um, first, do no harm. So we're often talking about um, very heavy. I mean, you I, just, I, I opened up this talk with a genocide. I mean, um, and even that memory for me was, um, is, is, is still painful to think about. Um, so being thoughtful about not just focusing only on what happened in the past and how um, horrible a lot of it was for people of color, but rather to focus on how we're moving forward and what a more positive, equitable and inclusive future can look like, should look like, can look like if we build it together. We commit to having an open platform, to complete transparency in the way that we do the work and the models that we build. Co-creation partnership, very central to how we do our work as well, very core to our process. Um, and then there are these two ideas, um, Sankofa and Ubuntu, which really kind of sit at the center of um, the work that we do. Sankofa, this idea, and you'll see um, uh, a bird sort of looking backward at an egg that is really on a lot of the um, uh, materials and a part of our brand for our products. But that's really about, you know, you can't move forward without, under, without understanding where you come from, where we come from collectively. And then the Ubuntu idea is just this very fundamental point that we are all human, we're all connected to each other, and we're all connected to the living earth. So first up, the first project to come out of this uh, colonizer reparation index is Ask an Elder. And it is at its core, a crowdsourcing initiative that promotes intergenerational connection and wisdom sharing through social media engagement and art. So, you know, and the three prongs to that, we're building community around this principle of Sankofa, collecting stories, talking to our elders, connecting with ancestors. We are, um, collecting stories and histories to generate something we're calling wisdom themes to see what kind of emerges um, at scale uh, when you talk to uh, elders at scale. Um, and then really, again, expanding this corpus of data available um, for machine learning and AI tools. So why ask an elder? It is, and I love this slide in particular because, and I use it every time because it was really put together by my, my interns and I really had them kind of think about like, why are we doing this? And these are 20 somethings. Um, and this is, you know, in large part what they came up with, it is to tap into the wisdom in our collective history to build a better future. It's about really promoting intergenerational partnership and responsibility to build a better future, right? We are all responsible for this young, old, all, I think we're in like five generations right now living, five living generations. Every single one has a role to play in building this better future we all want to see. How do we lift up and share untold stories and the related wisdom across the generations? And how do we encourage people of color to embrace themselves, their elders, and their ancestors? And then, of course, you know, we're tapping into this already existing energy on social media around decolonizing history, connecting and understanding more deeply um, the arc of um, global history. 
So this is our starting question. We talk about asking elders. So it starts with this question. So what wisdom or story would you like to share with future generations? And then the conversation can take any number of turns from there. And what we've learned is that there are many ways and many pathways that this conversation can take. And I just put a few um, additional questions up uh, here where you can kind of see it's, you know, how do you define legacy? Um, we even had one conversation where um, a young woman was interested in how um, a grandmother in her community used to dress growing up. And she was curious to see um, how levels of modesty in clothing had changed over time and how community as a result of that has changed over time. And it was just really powerful to hear um, what is important and on the hearts and minds of our young people as it relates to what they can learn from our elders. So we also have some phases for our moonshot because um, I didn't talk a lot about my, um, my professional backgrounds. I know you have my, my bio, but I spent a lot of time, 20 years in corporate America, specifically building data products. And um, the last five years or so um, in the innovation space. So this idea of thinking big and pursuing moonshots is I'm very comfortable in that space. But I also understand that one must break it down and figure out like what are the pieces and how do you get to that place. And so these are kind of high level phases. There's a lot of work in each one of these. But the first phase and the phase that we're in now is around community building which is sort of figuring out and pulling people towards this project and this topic and, and, and figuring out like sort of, you know, where the middle is, where the, where, where the people are that want to have this conversation and be on this journey with us. Um, it's about sort of leveraging social media. So we've built uh, profiles on all the platforms to engage with our community. And then it's also about story collection and um, defining our voice. So when we say ask an elder, when we say collect wisdom, what wisdom are we talking about? What kind of, which elders, right? Um, and so really kind of being clear and intentional that we want the wisdom that's gonna make this world better, right? We want the wisdom that's gonna take us forward as humanity. And so being really centered and grounded and clear about that and showing that, right? Creating content that reflects that so that it's clear. Phase two, when we get into um, that period, it's now about um, curation and extracting insights from the data, wisdom themes, and creating a presentation layer that can then be reflected back um, in one location or from one location on the web. And then phase three is when it really gets fun, where we would we want to engage the artist community and um, connect uh, it with live experiences. And this, the idea here is, you know, we we're collecting this sto these stories, we're collecting these histories, we're having these conversations, and we want to share it back out with the world. And then we also want to have artists and creatives look at this information and be inspired by what's possible and be inspired to create um, and imagine uh, new possible futures and to share that with the rest of us. And so that is, um, is where we are with phase three. So to the learning. So I'm always kind of figuring out how to iterate and, and pivot and shift in like micro increments as we, as we progress. I'm also one of those people who's just like, just start building it and iterate as you go. Um, so these are some of the things that we've, we've learned. Uh, elder must be defined as anyone with lived experience we admire and want to learn from. I think people get a little nervous. I'm not an elder, I'm not old or I'm, you know, so <laughs> it doesn't have to be grandma, right? It, it, it is, Anyone that you believe has lived experience um, is older than you and has lived experience that you can you can benefit from. Um, I think the other thing that some may be surprised to hear is that youth are actually interested in what elders have to say. I've had so many people come to me and say, "Well, dude, youth don't care. They don't want to know. They don't want to listen to anybody." That's not true. That's not true. That's not been my experience. Um, 
I've actually been very pleasantly surprised in the opposite direction by how young people are showing up and leaning in um, to this conversation and wanting to be a part of this journey. The other thing we realize is that elders really light up when they are um, sharing stories together in a circle and in community. So figuring out how to, um, as we're doing this work, bring elders together to have these conversations and to share wisdom that way is, um, is also something that we've been um, working through. And there is a global community interested in this work. Um, that much has absolutely uh, become clear as well. We've done quite a bit of work uh, both in South Africa where I'm based and here in um, Florida and in New York um, as well. And we'll continue to add cities and conversations in other places. And um, here's some images from some of the uh, in-person and on the ground activities that we've um, conducted over the past couple of months. We launched uh, or did a soft launch, if you will, or our first activation in June um, of this year for Juneteenth. And so we've been sort of actively at this work publicly for a few months now, but there's are some of our students and elders in Gainesville. That's my mom and dad and a really close friend um, in the center there. My parents have been married for almost 50 years and I learn from them every single day. Um, they're incredible and some of my favorite elders. And so how can you get involved? Join us. Uh, we're on all of the social platforms. This is a conversation that is open to everyone. Um, we want to, and we know we can, learn from elders of all stripes. So do please join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and um, add your voice or add the elders in your communities um, to the conversation as well. I always like to share a little bit on our team. So this is our leadership team. Um, it's an amazing group of data scientists, Riona is awesome, Milani, Dina, shout out to all you guys. It's been an amazing journey that we've been on. And then these are my lovely interns who have been working um, super hard managing our social platforms and doing tons of research and just bringing their energy and proving that like young people are, um, are here for this, which is fantastic. This actually is the um, one of my interns and her grandma, and I just love this photo, so I'm sharing it with you. Um, and it's a, um, the youth walk faster, but the elderly know the road. And um, I just think that's very powerful. And thank you. Saida, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for the information, the context and sharing. Um, we are about to transition to our third and final panelists and I'm gonna bring up a presentation as I click this button. Um, as we are now a good hour plus in, um, I definitely welcome everybody to again, stretch your body out, take a deep breath, move yourself, get up out of your chair if you're in a chair uh, get that blood circulating again and make sure again that you stay hydrated and also something that I was just told uh, by my chiropractor, make sure you look away from your screen from time to time, activate that peripheral vision so that we don't tighten up those muscles in the neck. Um, it is great that I'm going to bring up this next presenter, uh, Dr. S. Amare, who is going to definitely be moving the entire time. So I don't even have to pass her a mic because her mic is going to be attached to hers so that she can get things moving. So I will give it up and pass to Amma. Thank you so much, Oshubi. It's such a pleasure to be here and with these two awesome women. When they talk, I take notes. It's amazing. Thank you to Kane for making this, this alliance, this moment happen. Hopefully my presentation will also bring the three of us together since we are, aren't coming here without already knowing each other. So my presentation is called Improvisation, Gateway to Human Flourishing. The intersecting worlds of motion and media. So for many years, people have known me primarily as a dancer. 
and a choreographer and a teacher. And for many of those years in my early part of my career, I danced with London Contemporary Dance Theatre in the UK and Rombert Dance Company, doing works that we would call contemporary or modern dance works. And in the middle of the screen, you'll see an image of me performing a dance called Harmonica Breakdown, which was made in 1938. And it was choreographed by a woman called Jane Dudley, who is a very important figure in the foundation of modern dance in the UK, but she really arose in her career in the US and was one of the dancers with the Martha Graham Company and was also part of the new dance group. And the solo is one which I have continued to then teach to other people. So I'm a custodian of this modern dance work. And it's interesting bringing that work back into, into currency at this time. It brings in new, new issues when we're talking about and we're talking about how we borrow from other cultures, the music of Sonny Terry and the washboard being at the foundation of that work. So I've really also been for many years an improviser and this is becoming what I'm becoming synonymous with, which absolutely makes full sense to the blood that runs through my, my veins. From the age that I can remember, I was dancing at home with my mum, executing the social dances from Jamaica, the Blue Beat, and just performing in that social context. And I very well knew that what I was doing was creating. And eventually my mother then took me to a formal place to learn how to dance, but that essence has never ever left me. So jazz was the, the initial vehicle and, and still is really part of what inspires me and actually what brought me to the United States. It was the place where I was able to begin my inquiry into to jazz and what improvisation means in terms of it being generated in the moment, novelty, innovation, and shared understanding. And for almost 31 years, I had a nonprofit jazz exchange. And you'll see 1992 to 2022. In fact, jazz exchange has just had its sunset very emotional period of my life because it's been in my life for a very long time and has really been the, the foundation through which I, uh, I was able to play and explore across disciplines. So for many years, I've been working across disciplinary lines and deep listening began with my journey through jazz. And building works such as Jazz, the house that America built. There's a part three that is yet to be made. So it will be reborn at its right time. And something I'm becoming synonymous with, life is an improvisation. Your life is not an algorithm. Improvise, right? There are so many so many ways that we could take that concept, but the idea that now we are faced in our lives with so many corridors that have been mapped out for us, which we then either choose to opt into or we are navigated towards opting in without there being really a cognitive process that is supporting that choice. And in truth, life is an improvisation. And that's the beauty of life. If we knew the script before we got into it, would we pursue it, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a series of openings and ripenings and recoveries and new vistas. And so this space of movement and media, it seems antithetical to technology to think about improvisation but it's an interesting contradictory aspect of my being uh, how do we get the technologies 
to be also part of the journey of improvisation. And so for many years in the UK, I pursued a project which was called Text Territory. And I started it back in 2002 when I received a fellowship from the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. And with Lita Siegel, who is a new media artist, we developed a platform that enabled us to tell stories that had different tributaries in accordance with the audience's suggestions and insights to the character. And so you're seeing some images here of a story which was centered around a character called Grace, who was a legal secretary seeking to go on a date. So it was very lighthearted, but it had some turns which the audience sought to experience with the character. And text territory over a period of 12 years, we had various iterations and 2.3 was to really denote when the first performance was, which was 2003. And I can very well remember in the United States at that time, you were still using pages. So when I came to the States, it really wasn't, um, there was no understanding of texting. So the generation that now, this was not your normal way of doing things. And I think that was a lot to do with the operators trying to figure out how to monetize texting. So it didn't arrive here until about 2006 um, in, in a preponderant way. Um, and unlike the two speakers beforehand, I have been at the periphery, let me say, of entrepreneurship. I have an entrepreneurial mindset, but I have not until now really sought the understanding of what it is to create business. However, improvisation as life will tell you that everything that I'm thinking about in terms of the arts also has an application in more broad sense. So I already started to make those kinds of interventions, if you will. And I began a, a, a process with Fleeter Siegel in developing ways in which we could use this platform of texting and audience and interaction way before you were working on polling and clickers back in 2004. And uh, we actually did a couple of projects, including one that was with an attorney, a, a group of attorneys who were learning how to build their own businesses. The pe not the people you think about when you think about improvisation, right? but as a teaching tool. And so in this video, you will, you will, you will see and hear uh, about a project that we participated, we, we shaped a presenter's view for the attorneys about how to position their personalities regards to their businesses. And we use interactive format in order to ignite audience participation. And so during this talk, the presenter enabled the audience to interact with them. So no longer was it just a simple, straightforward PowerPoint. Rather, it was one that was Everybody more dynamic. And so we started to measure engagement. We started to do some of the very things that Kishore was saying that you needed to do. But at the time, this was so new, so moonshot coming from a dance subject. Of course, I was not in the circles whereby one could reliably engage with people that might invest in such an item. And it really was before its time. I have a habit of doing that. But I'm, I'm working on convergence now. <laughs> so so uh, text territory really became the space of convergence, um, dance, gaming. And eventually I worked on a larger scale work that engaged 12 actors narrative storytelling 
with multiple plots and we used a baseline narrative which some of you may be familiar with uh put in head wilson um which is a a, a story that was ripe for retelling and the interesting racial component we really played with that so there was a production at nyu in 2008 and again Lita Siegel and I worked on that together. So this space of play, again, did attract the attention of other people working in the spaces of gaming. And Katie Salen of the Institute of Play, she was someone that was one of our advisors at the time. So there was a lot of ideation going on for me at this time, and I was thinking about text territory in the classroom as part of CRM, even thinking about it as a way to reimagine tourism, to make it interactive, and I'm sure all these things are happening now. And indeed, I was ahead of my time. <laughs> There's always another idea. So in 2009, I came to the USA, and that's when I joined the faculty at UC Irvine in the Department of Dance. And at that time, I also ignited this idea of ACRE, the Africana Institute for Creativity, Recognition and Elevation. And because of the wonder of meeting Gugi Wathiongo, who is a distinguished professor, and of course, a lion when it comes to thinking about decolonization and someone who's really lived the life of, of, of a renegade, of someone who's been on purpose. But before I came to the States, I was also, I was also initiated within the realm of activism by another artist, another artist named Modrasola Adebayo. And I directed two of her, her shows. One was called Modj of the Antarctic, which is an amazing story built on a true narrative of, of a slave woman escaping the South and journeying up on the train line to the north and then crossing the Atlantic. And then there was a fanciful flight of fantasy going to be uh, going to the to the Antarctic. But the, the first part of the, the story was absolutely true and um, powerful. And Modrasola, working with her over a, a 10 year period, really ignited my activist self. And the second piece, which I directed, is called Maj um, Muhammad Ali and Me, um, written by her, produced by her. And it really placed me in the context of why are we creating art? What does it matter what we do? And really understanding the power of what art can do to change and open the way. So when I came back to text territory, which I did initially on coming back to the States, I worked on a piece called text territory Congo. And this is when we were able to connect with smartphone technology. So finally texting and, and a new generation uh, of, of folks in the United States were already inside of the space, but it was just at the beginning of the smartphone. And we were able to engage the, the sound in the phone. So at one point we created a musical instrument and that was a very interesting point where we were actually able to create an even more immersive space. But overall, these performances, text territory, um, really animated the audience and the ways in which the audience were able to not just participate, but take the performance with them after the event was quite striking. And 
this piece, what was powerful about this piece was by the end of the show, everyone realized that the device that they had in their hand indeed contained the coltan cassiterite that was drawn, extracted from those hallowed grounds in places like the Congo and felt compelled to take action. This wasn't something that we realized to, to, to what extent people would feel this compulsion. And had we the insight and had we the, the capacity to have really scaled that performance and taking it on the road as a piece of activist theater, we would have been able to garner yet more influence for people to then take to their Congress people. People were ready to write to Congress after that performance. It was a, a powerful moment. But around that time came a really big disruption for me. In 2009, I started my PhD. And I had two really powerful pillars. I had the technology on one side, and I had the performance, the improvisation on the other. And I wanted to bring them both together. But it was just too gargantuan a project to think about putting these two spaces together. And as I looked into the literature, I realized there was a massive void in terms of our understanding of improvisation from an African perspective. So I went on to pursue the improvisational dimension of my passion. And I did an undisciplined study. <laughs> and indeed, undisciplined meaning wasn't sing, it was anti-disciplinary, it was not singular dance. It was looking at phenomena as a whole, looking at it holistically. And with that, it meant I was also out of my comfort zone a fair amount of the time because I was also looking at music. I was also inside of a cultural context that was unknown to me. There was a lot of stillness within this process where I had to intentionally pull myself back from labeling something as something that I understand or that I've got a category for. So there was a lot of iteration, there was a lot of experimentation and dreaming. And even beyond dreaming, I would say space, just space. And my work took me to the continent and to a community in a village called Copea, where I sat, danced, ate, slept, connected with the peoples and began to understand some new things by intentionally suspending that idea that I knew or understood. And, at, and as I'm emerging from this space, you know, in the last seven, eight years, I've, I've been moving towards using the term endogenous over indigenous because of the way it's mired and Jose Cosa will also give us the full sense of that the way it's in the term indigenous is mired in, in, in colonization and, and degradation and, and stepping down as opposed to recognizing and elevating. So I spent time in encapsulated within circles of women, men, not so much the children, dancing in very important social and galvanizing spaces. And what I learned was very subtle. It was not large, upfront, meeting me directly in the ways that we might normally think of information being received. So out of that, I developed embodyology, which is today uh, an embodyology person is engaged in a movement practice that's also engaged very deeply with music and it's working with individuals as well as communities moving us towards flourishing and i'm aiming along with many others to cultivate this field and i actually 
coined the term embodyology, and it's a reminder to me as to its origins and a responsibility to give back to that community and beyond. So really thinking and leaning into research justice so that we can also recognize knowledge, supreme knowledge emanating from everyday peoples living this knowledge today. So embodyology is made up of six principles that beget improvisation, beget performance, beget ritual, beget human communications. And through intertwining these principles, we move towards a, a more finite uh, understanding of self and connection with others. And the first principle you saw, meta principle is dynamic rhythm and before you say it oh rhythm that's not me oh you are rhythm you are rhythm you are rhythm act of breathing is the beginning of your connection to your bodily rhythm whether you can express it with the acuity externally is a process of learning just like another language that you would comprehend and be able to communicate in. Uh, Dr. David Pleasant's doing some powerful work in philosophizing of rhythm. I suggest you uh, follow through and, and, and find his work. But the part that he's talking about here, given its potential to simultaneous of simultaneous mul multiplicity, polyrhythm has the multi-dimensional scope to displace hegemonic force. And polyrhythm makes the participants work for the next step. It operates as a dialogic calisthenic. It's not consumed, but rather done. And so during the pandemic period, I began a, a virtual iteration of embodyology which created a way for me to com create community in the midst of our, of our anxiety and fear. I created a space and in so doing, I've deepened the practice. And so Joy in Motion is a space that we come back to weekly. And it's a space that has then supported this growth. So with the, with the program that I was running through the summer and the last two years virtually, we actually built a computer lab for the Copea Village School. And so they continue to grow as embodyology begins to flourish. And the idea of flourishing, human flourishing, is something that I think requires us to pause to look into further. And I wonder from this Celestogenesis chart, if we need to insert Cosmo Ubuntu, the theory that Jose Cosa is articulating further and further. So embodyology started to now move beyond the space of performance and move into connection with well-being, community well-being, and even ideation in terms of companies working to bring creativity into their space. We had a neuro art symposium whereby we had several scientists look into what embodyology is to then bring out this notion of meta-awareness. So it's this polyrhythm developing a meta awareness. And so movement as medicine, that's the journey. One of the tributaries that 
that embodyology is forming. And we're just about to start a study that is going to be with students, students at UCI, and we have a, a grant from the Integrative Health Institute. And Dawn Bounds is the scientist that's leading us through this study. So, sustained cohesion through social practice. And so now I'm going to pivot to the other space of improvisation that came out through the pandemic. And that was the development of AI for Africa. I went to the AI for Good Symposium uh, uh, out in Geneva in 2019, and I became the poster girl for diversity, unbeknownst to me. There were less than 10 African descended people within a group of 4,000 presenters and audience members. So I took arms. <laughs> I said, well, if you're gonna use me as the poster girl, we need to sort something out. So what I did was I reached out to my various networks to connect with amazing people like Kishore Rogers and Saida Nash Carter. And within, it, within a period of three months, we cohered to build this entity. We were supposed to go to Geneva in 2020. And this is also when I connected with Kane. And this was a space where we were going to give all kinds of keynote talks, fireside chats and, and the rest. But it didn't happen. But we did give other virtual talks with the with the program so this is some of our contingent and this again has brought me back into connection with my media my digital side and really important questions that we've been asking and that we're continuing to ask and we were invited by the university of florida through came and the African Studies Department to also to build a forum. And more recently, we had a forum with the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm going to close here now because I think I have jumbled the worlds of SR Murray enough to uh, pass the mic back over to our host, Ashubi Craig. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, that was fantastic. Um, so as we transition, we are going to call our presenters up uh, to come join me here together. And I'm going to pass everyone mics. All right. Um, so uh, we have uh, one question that I'm going to kick off. And uh, first, thank you all. Um, I think it's important um, in the context of the conversation that we're having to um, and Ama, you are starting to get to it in the end with respect to the journey with respect to AI for Africa. I wanna say thank you for being willing to come on this journey with us and came um, in the conversation and really the, the diverse perspectives that you all have explicitly in just how you are centering your connectivity to AI, to emerging technology um, is really important. Um, and one of the things that um, in some of our first conversations that I had with you, Ama, was about that AI is just a tool um, and that you are not a technology person and that, that stuff, you know, you, you interact with it because you have to, but that's not your actual natural space, uh, but your willingness to leverage the skills as an organizer to gather people around that theme and how important, um, not just representation, but true participation to understand the impact of the tool is really powerful. So I wanna first start by saying um, thank you to all of you all uh, for bringing those things forward. Um, so as I jump into the questions that are here in the chat, um, <laughs> uh, the one question that popped up that, uh, that Marie passed to me, it says, um, uh, I'm a, when, when will you revisit Africa or Europe? When, when, when are you headed back to travel-wise? That, that's the question that we had in here. Next year. Next year, I'll be going back to Ghana for sure. And probably a trip to Nigeria is overdue. And the UK usually sees me on the journey anyway <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed yes indeed um 
We have a specific question that's from uh, Barbara McDade Gordon. Uh, this is for Saida. Um, and the question is, um, uh, can we view the historical knowledge of elders as uh, innovative in the sense of time? Uh, we often hear there's nothing new under the sun. Hmm. Lift your mic. Oh, sorry. Yes. Can we view the, the wisdom of elders as innovative? Um, I think it's about the apl application of the knowledge in current contexts. And that's where the innovation happens is that um, there is probably fundamentally nothing new under the sun, right? We're humans yes. living human experiences, but the contexts change. And so applying wisdom um, in new contexts allows for not repeating mistakes, but then also um, better innovations, I think, within um, current times. I think I, that's a powerful and uh, definitely appropriate response. Um, Kishar, for you, I, I listening to you talk about um, pro process uh, for you as an entrepreneur and um, a woman in this space and just in my own research of, you know, tracking the work that you've been doing, um, I'm curious about the... Um, the simple things that are kind of at top of list resources, number one, uh, and then potential books or blogs or podcasts or things that for you are valuable and inspirational um, in your process. Because I, I, I have heard you say at other times that the walk and the process of being an entrepreneur is one that is full of challenges, but you have very been, been committed to working your process and your process has yielded uh, really, really impactful results. And so I wonder for you, what are the things that you pull on to, um, to continue to push you forward uh, in the midst of a, a, a challenging walk as being an entrepreneur and, um, and as a woman who is definitely connected to technology at a very high level? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of questions, I think. Uh, so in terms of resources, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ray mentioned AI for Africa. I mean, you can just search anyone on that page of people yes, indeed. and follow, um, follow them, honestly, in their work. So I do track, uh, I track that work as well. Um, I, I follow a lot of systems thinkers. Uh, so, you know, and not just people that are alive, but people from the past. So I uh, just recently wrote a post on Marvin Minsky. Uh, he's one of the founding fathers of AI. And I look at that information from the landscape of who's not mentioned. So a lot of the books that we have that are older um, are written by the same types of people. And one of the things I like by AI for Africa is the focus on diversifying the content that we consume. So a lot of what I read isn't published or is by people that are lesser known. Mm. Um, I also, um, I also listen to things that aren't related to technology. And I've learned a lot about business by not reading business books, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've mentioned a lot about like the blank slate theory, the 16 basic desires theory. I mean, you find this stuff in like psychology books. Yeah. Like, so I, I'm, I'm subject to read a psychology book and learn a lot. Um, I learned a lot through embodyology with Dr. Ray on patterns and breathing and how that can impact ideation. So generally what I consume is outside of tech. And I look at it and see how I can apply it to tech. Um, I, I think that, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to specifically come to you around that um, in uh, your work um, as somebody who deals with improvisation um, and the necessity for um, us to create spaces where improvisation shows up in the, in the discovery, um, in the ideation process, in technology. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, and, and I know you alluded, it to, alluded to it, some of the work um, that's forthcoming um, at UCI, but um, how have you uh, evolved in your comfort level of um, placing yourself in the spaces specifically with data scientists and technologists uh, as someone who brings uh, improvisation to that? How, how how has that process and journey been for you specifically? And 
uh, what are some of the tools language wise to do some of the translation that often has to happen for people who are not accustomed to being in improvisational spaces? That's a great question. And I have a great friend. Um, his name is Derek Bunmel. He's a composer. He said to me, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, was to surround yourself with really smart people. Yes. <laughs> and so as opposed to being intimidated by them, come with whatever you're coming with humbly and ask questions. Uh, ask people to slow down um, because I think a lot can get lost in translation because we think we're supposed to know or we're, we're used to being in kind of echo chambers or silos where we all have the disciplinary language and the same language. And so when one is in those multidisciplinary spaces, one has to create space so that you can ask questions and they can ask them of you. Um, each of us brings unique properties, ideas, experiences, and dreams even. Mm. And that just respecting that everyone has a space at the table. I, I, I think that that's a, that's a great, uh, great way uh, to get to this next question. Um, uh, I have uh, one, this comes from, uh, Anita Spring, um, who specifically asked uh, that these says that these are really great concepts um, and uh, wants to work with you on uh, the implication. How can they reach out and do so? How can people connect with you all to work with you? Everyone? Sure, everyone. Kishaw.com is the one place uh, or LinkedIn. I would echo LinkedIn is probably a great place to, to start for sure, reaching out personally. Mm -hmm. Or oh, you can email info at embodyology.com. Excellent, excellent. Um, I have another note in here. Uh, this is a question for Kishar. Uh, it says, um, what is your opinion regarding African-American family-owned businesses who refuse to obtain websites or reject the social media exposure uh, do you feel that this family uh could be this family business could be can be successful that's a good question i feel like that's a personal question <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question you know i think so every business has its own i mentioned success metrics a lot and you know we can't assume that a family-owned business has the same success metrics as a startup that wants to scale into a unicorn. So some family-owned businesses are designed to serve their communities. And if they do that really well, like we have a dry cleaner in our community, we love her. When her business was tough, everyone just gathered around. They made sure she stayed in business does not have a website at all, yeah. but is a strong member of the community. Now, if the metric is that this person needs to grow and scale, then yeah, it's, it may be tough because the market size of that neighborhood is not very big. Yeah. Also competition, you know, so I think it depends, uh, which probably doesn't answer. It. it really depends. But, you know, I don't I don't necessarily think that your corner store needs to be on Twitter going exactly. on about what like exactly. you know I don't know if there's a lot of noise on the internet <laughs> so I wouldn't be mad if they didn't have a website <laughs> <laughs> no I I hear you on that um be, before I go to the next question any anyone else want to jump in on that specific question about the uh I just say when Kishore talks listen <laughs> so I was like I can't my yeah. yes indeed yes indeed <laughs> Um, this, this next one uh, is from our associate director, uh, Wilson Tremura, who says, is technology the only answer to uh, transformation of human society? And how would you envision a more balanced uh, blend between technology and human sharing common space? I'll say it again, just so that you, because there's a lot of words, I know. Is technology the only answer to the transformation of human society? And how would you envision a more balanced blend between technology and humans sharing common space? Oh, yes. Well, I can speak to embodyology and its transformational impact on communities that I have entered and shared this work in. I now have a teacher training program, so we are building that space um, so that more communities can be served. Um, there is a medical doctor that's also now uh, engaged very deeply in the in the work and she is part of the center for mind body medicine 
and we're building a center um, for the Buffalo community, whereby we're taking these ideas along with many of the tools that they work with in mind-body medicine to transform that community so that it becomes a beacon. I believe it's possible. And I think that the technology aspect of it will be about sharing the news in that in that way. And, um, and also, you know, as I've shown, um, Embodyology also has a virtual iteration. So we can do this between the children in the village and the children in Buffalo. So we can use it in those ways. And I believe yet that there's another layer of technology that hasn't arrived on the earth yet. Mm. And it's going to come out of polycentrism. Mm. I'll just make a, a, a quick comment that I always say it's important to remember that technology is a tool. Yes. Um, it, all of it, whatever type of technology you're referring to, it's, it's a tool. And it's important to just remember and think about what are we, what's the goal? What's the end? What's the, where, what's the, the destination? And then pull all of the things that you need to get there into the mix, technology, embodyology, all the things. Um, but it is, it's a tool and, and we shouldn't, AI as well, we shouldn't forget that we're in control. Yes. I think the short, I, I love her, uh, Saeed's answer is I think it, so sometimes when we talk about technology, like from the context of where we are today, you know, we may have a very specific technology in mind, like AI robots. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, they were like these, you know, clocks, you know, <laughs> what's up with these clocks? You know, why, 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 can't, why, can't, why can't we use something else? So I think, you know, from the standpoint of innovating and finding better ways, faster ways, more effective ways uh, to improve lives of humanity, I think technology can be one of many important tools. I think the issue is what's being centered. And so one of the things that I talk about a lot is centering people yes. instead of the tools. So we love our tools and a lot of the news talks about tech as if it's magic and, and, and we want the tech to solve the problem. And if we see tech as a problem solver, then I think we're in trouble. So if, as long as tech enables us to solve problems, I think there are opportunities for tech to enable us to learn better, to learn faster, Microphones are technology. Yeah. We're yeah. streaming online. So obviously we can connect to people through technology, but it doesn't mean that the tech is responsible for us talking to our friends, yeah. calling our mom, like yeah. doing the things that are yeah. really important. Yeah. Um, I think that that's really, really powerful and fantastic. And I, and I, I will um, ask for the grace of the panel to that. I just want to add one thing on that is that, I, that watching um, in the last two and a half years, um, as we are in this COVID era moment, time period, phase, whatever, however you want to describe it, um, the shift that has happened and the acceleration for more uh, of us in society to adjust to a space where our connection and um, reimagining of the use of the tool has shifted. What COVID did was it sped up the concept of remote work. It sped up the concept of gathering people through the computer in a way where um, three years ago to convince someone to go to a doctor utilizing their laptop would be unthinkable. And now people were like, if I don't have to come in and I don't have to be around the other six people and I can still get the information, sign me up for that package. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to see that. And I think um, the other space that, and I was just talking with um, Ethan and Jared in the room of how in which we continue to build moments of community connectivity and also allow for people that are, can't be there to still be a part of what's going on. And so how we are balancing those two things, um, especially for folks that are in traditions where it's about you being in the space, listening to this music or making this movement or gesture and trying to figure out how we provide a balance. So um, I'm, I'm excited about this new technology that hasn't landed on the face of the earth that's going to allow for that to be to, to happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that there, there's hope and that hope sits in, in your hands. Um, another question that's coming in, um, and this question is uh, specifically for society. Now everybody has questions. The questions are, are, are streaming in. Uh, the question for society says, are you uh, familiar with the Nguzo Saba? 
Uh, also, um, have you ever heard of Building Resilience for African-American Families? The um, acronym is B-R-A-A-F. Those are the two questions. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the Nguza Saba. I grew up celebrating Kwanzaa, so I have all the knowledge as it relates to them. Um, so yes, is the, is the, is the first answer. Um, I'm, le I'm not familiar with the second organization that you mentioned though, and I would love to learn more. Excellent, excellent. All right, I have, uh, I think two AMA questions here. Uh, the first one is from Samuel and Samuel, I do not want to butcher your last name, so I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to throw the question to uh, Ama. It says, uh, great job. Your presentation of AI resonated with the advocacy of indigenous technology on all aspects of human lives. Also a big shout out uh, to Wilson. Um, so no question, just a comment to let the people know that, you're, that they're, they're, they enjoyed what you had to share there. Um, hey, Elika. Ah, okay, okay. And then I'm making sure that I have not, okay. Uh, this is another um, a question. This is from Sylvia Jackson, who says, how many African-American students attend UCI? Do you have um, any black students in your classes right now? Yes, uh, I do. But this study is focused on students in STEM and the College of Health Sciences. And there's an organization within the School of Medicine that is really focused on recruiting African-American students, black, African and Caribbean students. They're making deline delineations. Um, and overall, we're talking a very small population, 3% of 40,000 students. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think um, to that point, I think one of the things that's important, um, and again, to give you specific praise, Amma, for um, the gathering and the conversations and the um, the community that's being built uh, through AI for Africa of representation is a word that people throw around a lot. They're like, we need to have some representation so that we have a number to check off on the box, but not representation in that way. Representation in the way to be at having a seat at the table in the context of AI for good on a global scale. Um, that's that's a different level of what representation looks like. And, and so um, again, can't say enough about the thanks and kudos for not just what has happened now, but really the groundwork of what is happening in the future um, tied to the type of work and the type of technology um, that is being developed and to make sure that there are um, people from the continent and from the diaspora that are at the table in those conversations. Um, uh, one of my old mentors say, if you're not, you know, if you're not at the table, you might be on the table getting, getting chopped up. So make sure that you're at least at the table. Um, have two others that have come in. Uh, this is from Anita. It says, uh, we need to gain um, uh, the terminology and use of various factors and methods. Uh, we, the came faculty, uh, can learn in this process. Are you planning to teach a course at UF or remotely um, from your other locations or possibly even in person? Many of our regular classes uh, do include ritual and divination, but need to expand that knowing. I'd love to create a class with all three of us, like create a, a meta class. I, 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 would, I would love to see that as well. So, so what I hear is that we're gonna, we're gonna start working on our team teaching class uh, coming up potentially in the spring of 2023. So everyone stay tuned because uh, because that is that is definitely coming down the pipeline. Um, I'm going to pause and switch gears in the sense um, specifically with this group of folks, um, just because for us, it's the first time that we are together. And I feel like I have known all of you all in different pieces for a, a sustained period of time. Uh, so before we have questions from the audience, I want to see if anyone has questions for each other in the context of the information having listened to these presentations today uh, before we jump to questions back to the audience. I, I think the one just sort of thought I would throw out there, you mentioned it also, Ama, like what can we do together? I think that's the, that's the question. Mm -hmm. There's so much, like you talk about convergence and you know, there's, there is convergence here. Yes. Yeah. I just like being in. <laughs> <laughs> in connection because there's so much learning so much clarity 
and it's you know it's affirming as well but it's also new doors are being opened and i think this piece around what kishore mentioned and i'd love you to elaborate on this in terms of success metrics you talked about that your team is also still enjoying the work hmm. that i was arrested by that so i would love you to speak about that yeah it's an important um it's actually an important metric you know the work that we do starts be being really financially focused. And one of the things that's different about our application of technology is that we put people again at the center. So we're not just measuring how much money customers are making, we're measuring how happy are your employees. Uh, so as you may, are they becoming less happy the more money you make, which happens a lot. Yes. Um, and then in terms of my team, you know, like we're in the time business. So we're studying and figuring out ways to optimize people's time so they can basically enjoy their lives and spend their time top of license. For my team, what that means is that we don't waste each other's time. Mm. We're not wasting our customers' time. Mm. So we have to be very mindful of the mission that we talk about. Are we living that mission? And I think that applies to any company or business person um, regardless but making time for play is important and it's something that a lot of companies struggle with is you know can I be profitable and have people you know going off the beaten path with other thoughts and ideas that are outside of my roadmap but what I've learned is that people do their best work when you give them space away from work to explore other ideas so we actually just build that into our process which is why i encourage my engineers to spend time not thinking about tech because i, I think it's really important part of the creative process powerful yeah. yes did and i agree with her question yes just exploring ways to work together <laughs> yeah yeah would be great did a workshop for your team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do that. We had a June retreat in New York, and she basically led an embodyology session with the team, which was really different because, again, it's an engineering company, so a lot of my employees are engineers, but people aren't used to moving yeah. near each other at work yeah. unless it's a Christmas party or something. <laughs> so it was, it was. <laughs> It took them a minute to like realize, oh, I have to stand up, I have to move. Yeah. You know, I'm doing things. But it actually opened up uh, our creativity a lot and it really contributed to our brainstorming session. There's a lot that is happening in here that prevents people from articulating great ideas. So Alma's work is really important in that. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna go back to uh, another question that is in here. Uh, and this is, uh, this is for you, Alma. Um, this comes from uh, Fana Babadayo. Uh, and Fana asks, um, how can we get healthcare providers to integrate embodyology into patient care to promote um, its healing benefits? Well, we're doing this first, this first intervention. And so we're going to have data. We're going to be publishing. Um, I think reaching out to us, there are medical doctors who are advising us. And there are other systems such as the Samueli Institute. I have run programs for them. So we have programs that we can also demonstrate. But on that larger scale, it's going to be about, what did you say? The numbers lead. Um, <laughs> yeah, getting yeah. the data. And so there is another National Institute of Health um, pilot program that we are going to build a team around so that we keep um, building the, the awareness and and also the scientific proof of proof of concept. Um, so if you have any thoughts about doing any pilot programs, sometimes I think there are funds for pilot studies. So yes. If you know of any, let us know. Um, as we come to this one forty seven hour, I'm gonna. Um, uh, put a, a shameless plug in. This is the first part of our two part uh, event today. Uh, for those that are here in, in Gainesville, before you prepare yourself for this pending storm, you should come and hang out with us uh, at the U UF Innovate Innovation Hub. Uh, we will be there from four to six today uh, with a lobby chat with some refreshments and some time to uh, greet these incredible women in person. Uh, so we definitely want to invite you to come and be a part of that conversation as well. Um, and there's still time for you to register on the link that Marie just dropped into the chat. Um, as, as we think about um, where things are, are, are right now with technology and, and looking at the, the different shifts that are happening uh, where 
conversations are now not just where you are locally, but it's not even just what your region or your country, it's global, that we can be in conversation with people from our devices who are on the other side of the world um, and the leveraging of technology like WhatsApp and Facebook and all of these different mediums to bring people together. Um, I wonder um, for you all how you see uh, specifically um, the role of the continent as a place of innovation um, in context of what is happening aside from the absolute um, rush for the natural resources that are so important to all of these devices that we are dealing with, but what is the technological and the innovation um, uh, role that you see in your connection with working with partners um, in, on the continent about what is next when, when people are talking about uh, the idea of Web 3.0 and the fact that it won't matter where you live. You, you just plug in and you, you can be a part of that conversation. So just in your experiences, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, I mean, so whenever I hear any questions about technology or Africa, I always think, you know, is necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. Right. And um, some of the most creative and entrepreneurial people I've met in my life are um, Africans that I've met on the continent um, in whether it's East Africa, West, South, all over. Um, they absolutely have that in common. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll, I, that's a big question and I'll, I'll sort of pause there. I think it, uh, the continent, which, you know, huge, like, I think, number one, there's an opportunity to personalize the countries on yes. the continent of yes. Africa. And I think, you know, just globally, we need a better awareness of Africa, each individual nation, their yeah. tribes, is, is, you know, their actual people there. I think, um, so that's number one, I think, uh, expanding our perception of the globe so that Africa's included is a part of it. I, I think certainly you can learn from people that have largely been uh, excluded from this conversation because, I, I, you know, what I've learned through my work with uh, the WOW Foundation is uh, they're headquartered in Nigeria, but I work with them to um, to write curriculum for She Hacks Africa, which they now launched. They launched in 17 countries now, but it started as a really small project with them. And one of the things that I learned is that people are very entrepreneurial already. They're very creative, but they have to navigate different types of systems than we have to navigate. Yeah. And I think one, one thing we can learn is different ways of thinking about problem solving. I think that's already happening on the continent. And so just figuring out how to basically give the resources to allow people to develop their own ideas um, as opposed to bringing them here or somewhere else yeah. to develop those ideas. I think the University of Florida has a supercomputer, yes? Yes, in fact, we do. So I'm thinking as a resource, that could be amazing to partner with uh, Vokosi Marivate, his work on language translations from African language to African language, yes. not using the the Latin or European languages, that's important as Africa really starts to move towards trading internally, being able to fly from one country to the other without going to Europe. Yes. First. So these are the spaces that I think um, are ripe for innovation that's already been, the seeds have already been planted as Saida says, and what, um, partnerships that could happen such as with came yeah could be electrifying and i, I would say vokosi is one of the leaders um, in this area of language translation that will bring the elders into connection with today's youth because in some cases there's been a massive break when i went to uganda the children just want to speak english mm -hmm. because it's not in the tech world yeah their mother tongue doesn't show up there yeah so healing that rift, I think, could be enormously um, part of the future and on what then the elders can bring into this space. Uh, that's, um, I think, I think really uh, the, 
the opportunity for partnership again. And that's, again, why I'm excited about this, uh, what we talk about digital revolution, for lack of a better term, that uh, it's an it's a opportunity for a reset uh, and to adjust um, the concept of placement of access and um, opportunity shifts, that it's not nearly as complicated of you have to be in a specific spot, you have to just be able to connect and then you can also participate in that. That to me is what is exciting. Um, there is a question specific to, um, oh, there's a question that is specific to uh, you, Ama, and this comes from one of our uh, staff members and partners in CAME, this is Jeremy uh, Fresco, who says, what advice do you have for those of us working with students uh, who are struggling with visibility and support for their quote unquote undisciplined work. Uh, I am, uh, I recently spoke with a student in comparative studies uh, whose deep connection to dance as a community vocabulary and a way of archiving knowledge, uh, but who struggles to position uh, the reception of that work uh, within the academy. I think finding a network of people that can support that work, that can support the student, the specific student. There are scholars and practitioners that can support that person and I'd be happy to be part of that. Um, it's necessary to have um, advisors that are outside of the academy. You don't have to really make it known, but um, one needs support so that you realize that your ideas have worth and that they have there's a place for them in the world beyond the graduate graduation date and so i would say building that that, that network is the is an important part of that sounds good sounds good uh we are at the 155 mark um i am going to uh pass it to everybody for closing thoughts um and really with some time of what uh, you would like our folks to take away from uh, what you share today uh, as we bring this part to a close. And I will start with you, Saida. I think the uh, my closing point is just that um, the future is ours to make, to create. And it is important for us to take that role seriously. Um, it is important for us to leave the world better, to be good at that. It, um, yeah, let's do it for our children. Pretty straightforward. Well, thanks for inviting me. I want to say that first. This was a lot. Most welcome. Uh, my closing point, I think the general thing uh, of my talk was really around the word expert to me is such a heavy word. And I think sometimes in, in our roles and the jobs that we do, that word could be a, a barrier to discovering a new idea because you assume that you know everything. So the, the theme of my presentation was don't make, just assume that you don't know anything <laughs> and then connect with people. And that's where you discover great ideas that may or may not involve technology. And I would say to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. Step out of that which you know and be open to discovery. That's fantastic. Um, I want to just uh, take a moment to, again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, uh, again, evidence of how much of an amazing uh, group of affiliate faculty we have here in Kane. I want to note to everyone that uh, this fall, we're going to be putting out a call uh, for new affiliate members and funding support. And so uh, be on the lookout for that information. Uh, I wanna give a special thanks to uh, Ethan Tripp, um, Jared, James Oliverio, Tim DeFato, Jan, the entire Digital Worlds crew for being our partners in making this amazing stuff happen uh, in their studio. Uh, a special thanks to our CAME team, uh, Wilson Tremor, our Associate Director, uh, Carla Lewis, uh, Jeremy Fresco, uh, Hannah, Alia, Eric, uh, and our newest team member, Marie Kessler, uh, for all of the things behind the scenes so that we could get to this specific moment. And it has been an absolute adventure. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, we will be in contact soon. I'm getting information that our 
afternoon events might not be happening because we have different things starting to shut down here at UF. I know that we'll send out an email and let you all know what's happening. Have a great rest of your afternoon and we will see you next time.